time is a bit different than what we have heard. So um, our panel is about uh, AI and uh, and we figured out a little bit um, maybe provocative title, which is uh, is AI uh, for telecom only for optimization. And if the answer is yes, then we can maybe go home. So my name is Timo Jokiaho. I am ex Nokia, ex Huawei, ex Samsung, and most recently 10 years at uh, Red Hat, bringing telco, no, not telco, cloud technologies into telco networks. And now I'm an independent um, <clears throat> telco technologist, as I call myself. But uh, this week I'm representing a company called IS Wireless, which is a Polish open run startup uh, building uh, radio access for private networks. So I'm going to invite our panelists to, to the stage and then I introduce first what we are going to talk about. So the first one, uh, Priya Kurian from IBM, please come to the stage. Welcome. And then Rope Suomalainen from uh, Silo.ai. Welcome you too. Thank you. And Samu Saarinen of AMD. Sorry. And Arne Talman for Accenture. So we have a great lineup of uh, panelists here. <clears throat> so I introduce a few things we are going to talk about uh, during next hour or so. So um, there are <laughs> quite a few AI use cases for telco telco networks and telco companies like preventive and maintenance and uh, threat detection and security customer service and all those things uh, and in telco networks you know there are ai use cases for edge computing and open ran for example and core network oss bss and so forth but we need to remember also that uh, we are not just talking about telco networks. We are talking about telcos as companies. So they have, of course, networks. That's their big asset. But they do have other stuff like back-end IT, uh, IT systems and data centers and whatever you have. And AI is obviously applicable to all of those, any of those. So we try to tackle, uh, tackle those things. And like uh, Stefan said in the previous panel, 6G is supposed to be uh, AI native network, whatever that means. But that's that's the idea and that's the plan in the industry. Now, before I hand over to the panelists, uh, I'll a little bit talk about Oran Alliance, which is one of my favorite topic. And Oran Alliance uh, has this, uh, defined their you know architecture and interfaces and. They have a concept in, in their multi-vendor RAN implementation and deployment called RAN Intelligent Controller, which is hosting uh, entities called X apps, which can, which can uh, manipulate and modify, let's say, radio landscape. They can, uh, they can enhance the performance of uh, radio. They can work on radio interference and they can work on radio unit um, power consumption. Uh, those are not uh, necessarily AI components, but RAN Intelligent Controller is a perfect place to have AI algorithms as well. That's an example of how AI can be uh, applied to radio, uh, radio edge or radio access. So that's what we talk about. And... Um, and let's hear the panelists what uh, what their viewpoints are. So I ask everybody to introduce yourself and your little bit of company and your approach to AI. And let's start with Bria again. Thank you, Timo. So um, I know that in the last couple of years, in particular, the world has gone crazy talking about AI, especially after Chat GPT emerged on the scene. But the thing is, this is a technology that goes back before World War II, originally, 
around that time, the first kind of statements around it. But in 1956 with the Dartmouth conference was when AI got its name. And I'm really privileged to work for uh, IBM that was part of that conference. So number one, this technology has been making its presence felt for many decades, but there are reasons why it is now that it's come together and kind of emerged as a key technology. Then in terms of uh, who I am and what I do at IBM, I am part of IBM's thought leadership division. So the purpose of thought leadership from IBM is to help our clients get the business value of technology. So I lead the telecom, media, and entertainment industry uh, from a research standpoint, and therefore I publish reports. And our reports, one of the things that we do is we conduct surveys of execs, in no, uh, depending on what the industry is. In my case, it's telecom execs. So we do what we call double blind surveys. So we survey execs, they don't know who's asking them the question. We don't know the exact individual who's responded. But as a result, we collect data. But I also then do interviews with execs. So over the last year, for instance, uh, we published a whole series of reports. And for that, I've spent time talking to C-suite, particularly CTOs uh, across the world in terms of their perspectives, especially on AI. So with all of that, one of the things is, as recently as last month, we had a new uh, survey come in, and I thought it would be useful to set the context uh, for this discussion by sharing some of the data points that we have recently uncovered. So five points that I want to make. Number one is that technology, of course, is very important to the telecom industry. So. I think the uh, data point we, uh, you know, that's published, not from IBM, but is available is 330 billion was the CapEx uh, spend on the network in 2023 by the telecom industry. To that add, our findings is that the telecom industry spends more on IT compared to the all industry average. So it's about 9.18% of IT spend um, is of, sorry, of revenues. Now, if you do some simple back of envelope kind of calculations, if we said that the telecom industry is 2 trillion, give or take, then 9%, you can do the match, that's 180 billion. So 180 billion plus the 330 billion of uh, network spend, we're talking about half a trillion spend on technologies by this industry. So technology is important. Therefore, you wouldn't be surprised to know that the AI spend that the telecom industry spends already is more than the all industry average. That's about 11.47%. Now, the second point I wanted to make is telecom companies and operators are looking at moving from just adding AI. So we would say plus AI to everything you're doing to becoming AI first organizations. Why? That's an interesting question to ask. So the question why is because execs have said that one of the things that they would like is to get their organization to change position in the industry. The second thing that they've said is they want to use AI as a way of creating opportunities into other industries. So that in itself is an interesting perspective when you take a look at why AI is becoming important to the telecom industry. The third point, what Timo was talking about, our survey, particularly on generative AI, since that seems to be the hot topic, what are the three areas that the telecom industry is prioritizing? Number one, unsurprisingly, is customer service. Number two is networking plus IT. And number three is cybersecurity. So these are not surprising, but just to make it clear that that's our findings as well. Number four is that as part of the reports that I publish, I spend time tracking operators around the world. There are several who are claiming leadership positions in when it comes to things like large language models. 
So AT&T are uh, proud about what they've done. They use it for software uh, patch uh, development and patches uh, deployment. The Chinese operators have actually launched uh, LLMs, which they use cross industry, but they also have a graphic image uh, kind of model. So we're not talking just about language. So there, and then we've got the AI Alliance with SK Telecom, Singtel, Etisalat, SoftBank, and Deutsche Telekom that's looking at a telco specific LLM. So there is activity that where the industry is focused on it because equally I've heard people say, oh, relative to banks, you know, the telecom industry is quite slow on adopting new technologies as they come. But we do see some interesting perspectives on this. Final one that I would say is that in terms of the barriers that the industry is seeing in for adoption, one is around business case development. They are struggling to justify that. The second is they feel that um, expertise on the technology is not easy to come by because obviously they're competing with technology firms for these skills. And the third is actually having access to the technology particularly with generative AI, with the costs of the technology, it is potentially getting uh, difficult for the smaller operators to access. So those are kind of five points I want to add in and then pass over. <laughs> Thank you. Robert? Thanks, I think that was a really good opening and kind of a support really much of our, our, our thinking and in here. But yes, yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Robert Suomalainen, and I come from a company called Silo AI. Uh, we are the largest uh, AI consultancy uh, in, in, in the Europe. Uh, kind of from a global terms, we are still relatively small. And kind of where I say, let's say like it probably tells a little bit about the maturity of AI in Europe than about our um, ambitions. But the kind of what we are uh, doing is like we are helping our customers to make their products, their services more, more intelligent. Or, kind of a, let's say like to, uh, of course like when you talk about a ai you can go to the aws gcp uh azure and get ai uh, from an api or then like if you're really kind of looking for a more sustainable competitive advantage sometimes you have to be creating your own technology your own neural networks language models and, and what have you and kind of a, the the, la, the late, latter part is on what on what we are doing and therefore also kind of a, sometimes seeing the ugly truth there's a lot of i would say hype around ai there's a lot of press releases around ai which quite often do not really match match, match, the, match the reality and kind of a, probably let's say like if you look at the your, your own en entities and feeling well like we should be picking up that's probably true but you you are not you're not alone so i would say like we are uh, in a your kind of a start of a of a journey uh, uh like a, i think that it was just the previous panel where someone said that it's the it's not a sprint it's a marathon and yeah that's that's definitely true and kind of as sometimes when we try to uh, kind of explain to our customers that like yeah the ai started 50 years ago and it will continue for the next 50 years the kind of like in a way let's say if we if you think of the in internet uh the companies launched they first websites in 20, 1998 or whatever year that was, the internet didn't end there. Then you actually started building. Now uh, everyone is, yeah, let's build our own chatbot. The AI doesn't end there. This is kind of like, how do you actually start enabling your organization to become ready for the kind of uh, up upcoming de decades to become competitive? But then uh, kind of like when we talk about the uh, kind of AI, when we talk about the use cases, and of course the, the easy way is that like we start talking about the efficiency gains, we, we uh, start talking about the optimization how, on how do you do the things a little, little bit better? How do you save a bit more of a, uh, a bit more of energy? How do you get a little bit more out of your, your ne 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 network? That's the kind of uh, the first natural uh, step. The second one is like, how do you create better AI enabled products, like let's say like could the security uh, services become better by utilizing some of the, let's say like ma ma machine learning uh, ca 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 capabilities. Uh, 
uh, and then the kind of a third uh, step is the uh, transformative things. What what can AI do to really transform uh, the the in industry? And like just as a uh, ex example of a trans like uh, uh, well when when OpenAI released the ChatGPT. Uh, kind of a, let's say like there was a lot of me media coverage about Google raising the red flag that now our search business is in uh, jeopardy. Of course, like OpenAI is not building a search platform, but kind of a Google saw that actually if people move from the traditional search to a, a, a AI a chatbot, what does it mean for the for their business? So like uh, you know what could be those things? That are transformative for the tele telecom in, in industry, and uh, kind of like what 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 those would be would mean mean for you, and like in a way the uh, the say uh, another thing like when we often talk about the killer apps, I think there was the discussion about what were the killer apps for three G, four G, five G, for the different app stores. So far, I haven't I haven't been able to identify those. Uh, it's about the uh, enabling a lot of use cases. I think like if you are a large corporation, I assume that let's say like you would be having hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of AI models in production. So it's, a, it's about uh, industrializing that approach. How can I bring a, a new utility that improves efficiency of that one or now makes my product a little bit better? Uh, and then you use it before another thing comes uh, becomes available and replaces the, the, the old one. So like, uh, in a way, going beyond that, let's not search for the single use case, because most likely that doesn't exist, but kind of doing it on various uh, various areas and then kind of trying to balance, okay, let's say like, how much of my budget am I putting uh, in, into the efficiency ones? How much am I investing to build better products? How much of money can I afford to put into transformative or can I afford not to invest into transformative things? Because if you don't do it, someone else does it, then you might be kind of a re re really screwed. Uh, and the kind of like, uh, the, if you think of these kind of a transform transformative things, uh, the kind of a like, what, what is happening within the new, new technology? Like as we are in, uh, uh, we are here, here in Finland, like I did a, uh, Quick Google search yesterday. I looked the uh, uh, m market value of uh, Telia, Telenor, Nokia, and Ericsson. They combined are less than the valuation of OpenAI. Uh, the sizes of the companies, the sizes of the history is slightly different. One has created a transformative approach on doing the business. Uh, of course, like how sustainable that is re remains remains to be seen. But there definitely is the potential also on the transformative ones. Okay. Samu. Thanks, and uh, thanks for for the invitation for the for the meeting. So my name is Samu Saaren from AMD. Uh, I have spent uh, my history in, uh, in in the mobile networks area, working for Nokia, especially for the radio networks, twenty plus years, and now for AMD, a uh, couple of couple of years. And and my role in AMD is to kind of build the bridge between the the catalog of, of components and solutions, what we have, whether, whether they are kind of catalog components or sem semi-custom or custom components, and then building the bridge for the 6G activities we are discussing here towards the standardization, especially the 3GPP, and then obviously towards the customers. Uh, for the earlier comment about AI being 50 years uh, on the table, so <laughs> so I, I also have to say that, that I did something 20 years ago that uh, nowadays would be called AI, but we didn't know that that there was such a term in in place, so we didn't call it that way. Uh, and then maybe I continue this uh, this uh, my introduction for the meeting, so that I actually answer to the question, Timo, that that yes or no. And I I do need to disappoint that it will be it it will not be no because I, I don't think that in this type of session you can say no for AI. I mean it's simply not possible. <laughs> Saying yes. Would mean, would mean that we need to live here, like Timo said earlier. So I, I need to say what uh, one Finnish politician said once, that that uh, strong maybe. So, and, and why strong maybe uh, for AI in telecoms? I mean, 
first of all, AI is everywhere. I mean, it's also in telecoms. Uh, AI is being standardized, uh, and and therefore it will be uh, on the on the table of operators. And when operators have it on the table, it will come to the telco vendors to implement. I mean, it, it, that is a fact. Technology itself, it has been leap, leapfrogging uh, lately a lot. I mean, what, what is today possible was not possible five years ago or 10 years ago. And, and what will be possible in, in five or 10 years, we don't even know. Uh, and then AI needs data. And ideally, I guess AI would need a kind of a complex optimization problem. And the telco networks certainly have, they do have data and they do have complex problems. So, I mean, it looks positive. So why why strong maybe then? And well, coming back to this complex problem. So especially closer to the to the base station side of the radio networks, there are already extremely complex functionalities that, that, uh, that if you want to further optimize those, most likely the, the optimization problem is not that that easy and straightforward forward. So you would be then solving complex problem, so to say, with a complex uh, tool. Uh, one solution doesn't fit to, to, to all the cases like we know. So if you, if you can spend $1,000 and you can use 1,000 watt in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the back end of the network, so then in the, in the uh, closest to the radio side, you maybe have $10 and 10 watt. And, and if there are people from Nokia and Ericsson here, so they are thinking that even that is too much. Uh, so, and, and the, I mean, the requirements, they are very diverse. So if you are like the chat, chat GPT would be one example that you have a lot of data, you have a lot of processing uh, work uh, workforce uh, to crunch the data. Uh, but then uh, on the network edge, again, I mean, you have extreme, like close to real time processing requirements low power consumption and this and that. So, I mean, the problems are very different. So then maybe also I do want to comment this. Uh, so who benefits? I mean, AI in telco, so who benefits? Uh, I don't know if Matti Latvaho is, is still here, but but uh, there would be this vertical and, and revenue discussion. So somebody needs to benefit on 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 the AI in telco and again from the mobile networks point of view so I mean the operators sure I mean they uh, low hanging fruit would be power consumption optimization in the network improving the security okay so they benefit in that sense uh, would there be some new revenue streams all in all for the operators I mean if they would be like really fancy in, in, today we have been discussing and yesterday as, as well partially about the joint communication and sensing so would that be some kind of a new uh, revenue stream for the operators if they would be selling that service. And, and ideally, if you want to uh, identify in the network uh, real time or close to real time what is happening. So, so there certainly is a nice uh, physical layer uh, optimization problem for the, for the AI. Then for the, uh, for, for the vendors like Ericsson, Nokia, so Samsung, who, whoever there is. So, I mean, they, I'm afraid that that uh, they need to have this sticker that AI inside, regardless of what I mean, they need to have it. And and uh, and, and as I said earlier, so operators will be requiring these features to be implemented. Uh, all the tier ones and the and, and the vendors, they obviously they want to sell something unique, something new, something something novel, so that that uh, they can they can claim that the portfolio is is also ticking the box of AI. Uh, then. From the end user point of view, so uh, for, for the telco, so okay, we already, I guess, have uh, AI in our mobile phones doing some uh, kind of a trans translation of the languages and so on. But other than that, so from end, end user, user point of view, I mean, it's a, it, it's a bit unclear thinking from the mobile networks point of view, what would be the benefit for the end users? But with this, so I mean, strong maybe is still my answer. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Thanks very much. So my name is Arne Talman. I'm from Accenture. Um, I'm part of the data and AI practice um, there. And I've been working in the industry for um, about 20 years. I started studying language models um, as my master's in, in the early 2000s. Um, I worked in uh, at Nokia um, 
I, I worked for Ericsson for for Huawei. Um, I worked at Silo AI for for a little bit, developing um, large language models. Um, I worked with a lot of the the Nordic uh, telecoms companies as a as a consultant. Um, I'm also a, a visiting researcher at the University of Helsinki, uh, studying language technology. Um, have a PhD in in NLP. Um, I think kind of um, I would also like to answer the question that um, that was set as at, at the title, um, and and I I want to kind of emphasize what Priya said. You know, this this technology has been there for a, for a long long time, but only. In the past, let's say, a couple of years, we've seen really kind of huge steps forward. And and what this has built is, is kind of awareness around different organizations that, you know, there is this thing, AI. There are, you know, machine learning models that we could use as part of uh, our business. Um, you know, what what is the benefit? How can we bring bring value uh, to the organization? And it's very natural that at the beginning of, you know, when, when you get a new technology, um, you start applying that to the existing processes and tasks and start, start automating um, what you are already doing. So in that sense, it's very natural that we are optimizing uh, what's, what's existing. Um, but once organizations get more mature, um, you know, they start realizing possibilities that um, that this technology brings in terms of additional uh, capabilities, new products, new services, uh, new revenue streams. And these these don't need to be completely new revenue streams. They can be kind of incremental revenues on top of. So I would not, you know, um, I think AI is not just for optimization, unless you define AI, you know, in, in some sense, all AI is optimization, but um, you know, you, um, I would frame it more like, you know, efficiency improvement versus revenue generation. Um, and, and that depends a lot on the maturity of the organization. And I would encourage all the, all the companies, everyone to look at, you know, industries that are more mature, software companies, digital natives who are building AI powered products and, and their revenue is, is based on, on AI, AI capabilities. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, lot to learn from, from those, but maybe with that, we can, we can kind of, there were a lot of good points made earlier and we can maybe touch on those. Um, Thanks a lot, uh, guys. Now, um, Bria already touched this point a little bit, but um, there has been a, a trend within the telco industry with the telco companies that they want to transform from telcos to techcos. And that's been going on for uh, quite a while, maybe, I don't know, five, six years. And it's still, it, so this will end up into AI. But uh, the history is that uh, uh, 12 years ago, uh, late 2012, uh, 50 major service providers uh, introduced a white paper called Net Network Function Virtualization. They released three uh, uh, versions of that, and uh, that changed um, how to build network uh, dram dramatically, uh, which means that it's a multi-vendor deployments, and industry has been practicing to to uh, collaborate better between each other because uh, it's not anymore one company builds everything so so that's one of the reasons and then open source and cloud technology started to chime in into this whole picture and that has led telco as a companies to think about that actually we would need engineering we would need r d because we need to understand how telco, how cloud technologies work, we need to understand it. We cannot just rely on the commercial companies to support it. Of course, of course, they rely on that, but they need to understand. So that has led into this trend of, from telco to techco. But at the same time, uh, everybody, all the service providers, I've been talking during last uh, many years, uh, mainly in EMEA and APAC, 
they have been struggling on getting uh, competencies in house you know or even even uh, companies who are building cloud technologies as their main job they have difficulties to get uh, uh, competent folks into the in 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 house and the same applies to telco companies and now they are even more worried when they need to understand ai as well as cloud technologies and multi vendor implementation and all that, all, all those things and of course we cannot help too much on 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 that side but the, there is a clear trend that telco operators are going back to be more technology companies than just operating the networks that's for sure now industry has as i said uh, been practicing on on uh, collaborate better between everybody some companies are better on that some are not that good and that brings me to a question to the panel or discussion with the panel uh, which was a little bit uh, touched in the first panel this morning if i remember right is the standardization aspect of standardization and open source aspect in ai domain how much standardization we need generally speaking in ai domain to be able to build lively ecosystem around the ai uh, components and ai companies and all that stuff anybody want to take this yeah uh, I, I can start kind of a, very very briefly uh of course the uh uh overall i think the kind of a, a tel telco industry has kind of shown the value of the standardization on kind of being able to create global ways on providing connectivity but then on the other hand it's a very heavy process and just kind of thinking of the pace that the uh at ai and technology is moving right now if we st now start standardizing on kind of a how to use ai in telco we get it standardized and approved in three years time and it's totally outdated uh but then like a, but the, i think the one thing is let's say that the uh well basically ai is based on data if you don't have data if you have crappy data you will have a crappy outcome uh so let's say that most likely there are ways on let's say like making the data cross usable across the dif different players of course there's a, there's a regulatory aspects uh and so and so forth but i think around the data there's definitely something kind of that could be standardized so i think i agree with <laughs> what you're saying the rate at which um, particularly after generative ai has become a term that most people are familiar with the rate at which the technology is changing is at a lightning speed. So last year, we were all talking about large language models. This year, we are already moving not just to small language models, but things like mixture of experts, where you have multiple smaller models working to derive outcomes or, or generate the outcomes. What that means is it's a technology that's moving so quickly and that's the opposite of what standardization does and so the questions at this moment in time are it's a stabilization matter so it's who knows whether we'll continue to have this rate of change but the analogy i would take is if you had the brick cell phone to begin with and you designed standards and everything to go with that huge briefcase sized mobile phone and then you get to what apple introduced um within a matter of let's say 18 months it would be a crisis because everyone who designed around the briefcase phone are going to get left behind because everyone else wants to go with the iphone so if we take examples analogies think through some of this aspect open source potentially if you do want to uh, extend some of the models perhaps but as uh, it always starts with ai works on data and so yes you can have data standards you can also have a look at how you get your data right. And if you don't get your data right, it's the story of the house upon the sand because there's no point looking at anything beyond that because everything is going to shake. So 
at that level and the data is probably not going to change that much so you can probably do things but how technologies and the algorithms and the progress of all of that is not going to be easy to standardize on yeah yeah i i get that Samu, Arne? Uh, go ahead. Okay, so a quick comment from my side. So first of all, about the standardization. So yeah, okay, so there are activities ongoing for, for selected areas, interfaces, and so on. Some some use cases, beam management, uh, CSI, uh, positioning, and so on. But then there are many, many things that, that the, the operators and then the, the telco vendors, they, they want to have their own secret source for some of the uh, whatever that is, I mean, packet scheduling or, or some transmit receiver functionalities and so on. So, so standardization hopefully will be enabling something, giving some structure, but then it will not be all because of the uh, pace of the innovation. And then about the, the ecosystem. So one, one really, I mean, it's I would call it like a tools ecosystem from the tooling point of view and and then the the ip point of view so that will be extremely important because if you have now you are working with one one model today maybe tomorrow you have 10 then 100 so you need to quickly be able to to create those models and 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 uh, with, with the many people who are not like the having a phd on creating that one specific model but but uh, having the tools uh, and the IPs and as an ecosystem will be extremely important. Yeah, I, I fully agree with, with the previous uh, comments that, that the current kind of generative AI especially is moving so fast that there's no point in, in start, uh, trying to standardize that. But, you know, generative AI is not AI. There are lots of, you know, machine learning and AI use cases outside of that. In, and in some cases, they could be more standardized. And I, I think where we, I, I think the point of, of kind of having data standardized in some use cases could be a good idea. Um, standardizing APIs, you know, what kind of input and output you, you expect, whatever the model behind that, that could be another um, example, what to, what to standardize. Um, then about open, open source, I think there's a kind of, um, there are use cases where where open source makes a lot of sense if you want to build competitive advantage and you want to build your own models and you know ai that model will be part of your core business um then you know you should build on on top of open open source and and create your your kind of own own models but then if you if you just want to you know automate the process or you want to integrate some AI functionality into, into some, um, you know, some parts of a, your business, then using, you know, closed source models could be, could be a, a better fit. So it depends on the use case. I would not say kind of, you know, everything needs to be open source, everything needs to be closed, but it's kind of uh, what works best. I agree on that. There are a lot of people in the industry, in some organizations specifically who are, <clears throat> advocating that all software in the world has to be open source which i don't agree at all but uh, that's another story now I, I i'd like to touch this point of uh, how quickly these things develop ai specifically how to, which is kind of contradicting with the standardization mm. traditional standardization and that also this quick uh, quick pace also applies to cloud technologies and i've heard this from many telcos that where the kubernetes based container platform is now the technology to be used all over the places all over the places and many telcos have told in a bit in a very serious way that hey open source people you have to go slower we cannot keep up with you you know kubernetes community releases three releases a year three releases a year, and then there will be three releases of commercial supported Kubernetes platform from several vendors, and and they want to push it immediately to telco networks, and the operators say, we can't take it. No, we want one telco release a year with five years lifecycle support. It's contra contradicting with the open source immediately. And I think AI is, is maybe even 
worse is a bad word, but AI is even faster. And somehow that has to be dealt with. Arne. Yeah, only this week there's been at least three major releases in by Google, by OpenAI, by Mistral in, in large language models. So, you know, next week there will be others. So, you know, the, the rate of change is weeks, not months or, or years um, in AI. Yeah, exactly. Now, any question? Yes. We already discussed that there will be a lot of opinions on AI. So we are expecting <laughs> a lot of questions uh, from the audience. Thanks for the quest, um, discussion. Um, so you kind of already touched upon the uh, things that I'm going to ask, but um, maybe more details. Um, so you're talking about AI. What you actually, I understand in this concept uh, context, we can talk about AI as a very general term. Uh, and here we actually mean machine learning. Um, but to standardize AI, do you think maybe we should first um, give the definition for AI? And if we have a definition for AI, then we can standardize parts of it. And where communication is most likely to be part one part of the AI, uh, that is more relevant to telecom. And then we can standardize, for example, some parts of that. Who wants to <laughs> should we comment um yeah. yeah um yeah i mean defining ai is, is not going to be uh, i mean ibm probably has a has a definition uh, accenture probably has a definition <laughs> um but i would not say that what we are talking about is only machine learning you know if we if you use um the open ai apis you don't know that it's just machine learning there's going to be you know logic rule-based uh, logic behind that API that's going to, you know, be integrated with the with the machine learning model. So yes, there are, you know, um, machine learning components, but it's not just that. Um, yeah, defining, um, I, I think it's a, it, it is a good, good idea to define what we mean by, by AI. Um, but it has a lot of like, you know, First of all, intelligence. Do we even know what the intelligence means for humans? So we can go very philosophical here. Uh, um, but I don't know. I, I don't have a have a clear definition that I can give you now. But um, anyone wants to comment? I'll take that on. So when it comes to definition of AI, I do believe the EU itself has a definition, if I'm not wrong, on how you define it. But if you step back from that. There are interesting aspects such as the original Turing test on what it means to say a computer is displaying intelligence, right? But equally, there's the Steve Wozniak test on, you know, the coffee test. So there are different ways of explaining what we mean by intelligence and then what we mean by artificial intelligence if the computer is able to match it. But I completely agree with Arne that it's not just machine learning. There's quite a lot of processing that goes into any of uh, the types of AI that we're talking about, whether it's, I don't want to use the word traditional AI, but mm -hmm. the AI that we knew of before our chat GPT appeared has multiple ways. Because when you take a look at a chatbot as an example, there are many things that are occurring at the same time. There's natural language processing, but then there's also looking up, let's say, rules. Uh, then understanding uh, that's where the machine learning comes into it, which is uh, what the sentiment is. There are so many aspects that all come into play. So this is why it's better to talk about it as AI than just machine learning, because machine learning is just one segment of all that happens in that space. But if yeah, you don't yeah, want to. Yeah. I, I, I think there's kind of a clear definition, but uh, maybe... Yeah, yeah, I think there was another question. Yes, Lance. <laughs> Who was the next? Yeah, go ahead. 
one one question and 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 the kind of fear or doubt which which naturally follows that question so the question is any complex system and then and the telco network with all these functions and sub functions and then you know components which are talking to each other which are supposed to keep some states you know when answering to requests or forwarding requests and, and and you have a complex communication between these components so any such system is is kind of natural target for these uh, uh, large language models right i mean you can apply them and then instead of keeping that state you 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 just say okay uh, 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 forward according to the to the uh, learning algorithm or something like that so can that be a a, a, a use case which you which you uh, were looking for and if 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 yes and if you if you apply the logic completely you know and even beyond telco networks and go and apply ai of that kind everywhere i i just you know probably that this this is a, the 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 point to to end the discussion uh where shall we end as as, as a human human race and something like do we lose the, the 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 competencies then you know which we need you remember the four years ago you know when the virus came virus came we our answer was social dis distancing the, 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 the you know shut down instead of having knowledge what to do with that simple thing which was called virus we had no clue you know shall we end up in in in, in a situation that we don't have answers to, to to simple questions in 50 years from now if we go on completely that that direction or 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 not <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I guess of course, like that's that is a uh, f philosophical question. But uh, uh, in, uh, uh, I think the kind of uh, uh, maybe the point is, let's say, like we will have to do things, uh, but as humans, what the machines are not capable of on doing. Let's say, like we may, we might not need to do the all the math calculations in our head because we have a cal calculator to exactly. do do it. Yeah. So the, I, I was like. A, uh, I think, like in in a way, well, at least for the time being, the uh, general artificial intelligence does not exist. We are yeah. not expecting to see it in the ne near future. So the, I think the kind of that the machines are good on combining what already exists, but humans are better on creating something new that doesn't exist. I think it kind of needs to change the perspective on kind of where we are kind of excel as as humans, and we don't then need to kind of spend our time on the let's say like. Uh, Le may less less impactful things but. yeah uh, i completely agree so if you take a look at what calculators have done what we have in terms of ai today is still an equivalent of the calculator technology we are nowhere near general intelligence now one of the things is as part of the work that I've done in the telecom industry, I've worked with, uh, you know, the Boston Dynamics robot. I've worked with drones I've, uh, for a f private 5G network. The reason I'm talking about this is because the real life ability for robots to function is difficult because real life throws all kinds of challenges that we as humans just adapt uh, to very easily. But the machines have to be trained and taught and for instance, seeing the robotic dog being able to climb stairs, we don't realize what a big deal it is because we just run upstairs. But it is a tremendous challenge because it has to, you know, the, the uh, compute of balancing it, if the weight goes this way, if one of its feet doesn't uh, get on the step, what happens when it falls? All of it is a process and it's a computation that has to happen. These are not trivial exercises at all. And this is part of the reason why, although for years we've been talking about robotics, it's still for a repeatable task again and again. I give the example of you don't have a robot, you might have a robot vacuum cleaner, but you don't have a robot a vacuum cleaner that also can go and load your dishes, that can then go and do the dusting and then clean your toilet. The day we have a robot like that, then we need to worry. But we are a long <laughs> way from that. Although I might appreciate one robot <laughs> that does all of that at home. 
But maybe a quick comment on, on that one. But I, actually, I think like what we've kind of seen, at least in the research, is that there's now a big advancements uh, in the kind of uh, robotics. The yeah. challenge kind of uh, has been that like uh, you have to really create a detailed instructions for a robot how to walk yeah. or how to pick up something. But now actually, well, uh, I, I think let's say like, yeah, I'm saying that the kind of uh, the large language models are overhyped. But actually, that's helping in the robotics yeah. because the kind of a, there's a there are ways. Let's say like if the robot doesn't understand on what what was the command, it can ask in a human language, and the human can explain and in, it can interpret. I think like we have have even seen the kind of a robots talking to each other in a human language to ask from themselves because they didn't they, they didn't know what the other one was meaning. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have we have this discussion when yeah. we saw the the Japanese uh, small airport robots uh, advising people that soon they will talk to each other and are completely independent. Yeah, but maybe a quick comment as well. So I mean, in in telco in the mobile networks, I mean the, the functionalities uh, are extremely complex. It's not like recognizing is it a cat or dog, and I would say that that uh, to this uh, human intervention that. Uh, uh, maybe forty percent of the time goes understanding the problem that you are trying to solve, and then I mean also understanding that that the, the benefit, uh, the kind of a pros and cons of that solution. Twenty percent maybe for the implementation, so you tell that this is the problem, please solve it, and then yet another forty percent really understanding and verifying that the problem has been solved, what you thought that you are going to solve. Yeah, Arne. Yeah, can I? Quick two points about the uh, about the discussion. Um, so I've, I've stopped making negative predict predictions about what is not possible in the future. Given the kind of open AI came came up with the um, ChatGPT, with you know based on research that was available for for quite a few years already. So we did not expect that that research leads into such great applications. So so I think you know the the advancement will will continue, and there will be new new innovations and things that we think are impossible now will be possible in let's say six months or twelve months or or three years. Second thing is I would kind of um, break down the the AI technology or or the kind of process into three steps. One is making the prediction, and the model you know AI uh, models should be there making the predictions and the next step is decision and there humans should play a you know key role in taking the output of the model um you know making making decisions and the third third step is is kind of action so so you you know models should be or or ai should be part of making the predictions humans should be involved in in you know deciding and and making the actions of course you can you can automate the action once humans but hum keeping human in the loop in in all of this is is kind of important if we want to you know stay safe <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true go, go ahead um, maybe I've actually a kind of a comment uh, on that one like uh the uh I think like we've been working uh, kind of uh, with a uh, improving the efficiency of a 5G modem and uh, it's a really kind of a low latency, uh, high accuracy type, type of thing. And the very smart engineers have spent tens of years on making the rules mm. uh, to work it on, on, a, on that level. But then, of course, let's say like you end up uh, kind of uh, being a little bit inefficient and spending a little bit too much energy. Uh, so kind of a, let's say like then we were actually a bit building a, uh, well, a reinforcement learning model to predict, okay, let's say, like, what should be the clock speed in uh, in with, for the next uh, fifty milliseconds, uh, and kind of said, let's say uh, we got some good results, but then we actually not said that well, actually this will not work; it will not solve it. And then then we kind of build another model, which was predicting that are we actually understanding where the model is? Are we on a familiar zone? <laughs> and then we now we are somewhere that we don't the model doesn't understand. Let's give it back to the humans. So let's uh, hand it over to the rules based system. And then when we kind of uh, identified now to, uh, uh, we are on the safe side again, let's give it back uh, to, to, to the machine. So it's not kind of a uh, yes or no, but kind of a, you, you combine uh, those sort of things and it can also 
kind of a, let's say like the human in the loop doesn't necessarily mean that there's actually human pressing an accept button or something else. So we have another question from, from the audience, yeah. uh, a few uh, minutes to go. Thanks for the discussion. And I, I believe that most of the discussion goes to the applicable applicable uh, and the, the use of AI for wireless communication. So I am wondering how, how do you see the role of wireless communication for AI for and then like uh, better use of AI or making AI more business driving? I don't think I quite understood that. <laughs> What was <laughs> what was the question? So sorry, sorry. I mean, uh, how, like, what could be a role for the wireless communication for AI? You can like uh, using a wireless communication technology to build and build uh, some AI applications. For for example, you can think of like a collaborative AI where we have different agents. They need to communicate with each other. Of course, we need to build a communication network there, right? So what could be requirement from wireless communication side to for AI? I don't know whether you catch my question. Mm -hmm. That's that yeah. kind, of, uh, kind of the other way around that, uh, how yeah, yeah, AI exactly. can help yeah. wireless and now how wireless can help AI, correct? Yes, exactly. I, I think at least like I, I was uh, actually having a discussion uh, uh, that kind of, let's say like, uh, does the AI exist without the connectivity? And the answer was that probably not. Yeah. So yeah. like, yeah, I think they're kind of, it, it is needed. It, it's not necessarily needed all the time, but uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's of course very important for many of the use cases. So mm -hmm. you would not have certain use cases if you would not have connectivity between where the, you know, from the edge to let's say the, the data center. Um, you know that's that's needed whether you know what kind of connectivity i don't know if it if it is a big big kind of well it could be important yeah true true so we seem to be so up for i have a question okay from here there. this yeah. way <laughs> <We're there. laughs> yeah uh thank um thank you for the for the panel so at the beginning, you have been mentioning Up and Run and like the application of X apps in the radio access network. How do you concretely see the impact of AI in the evolution of the run? Because the more we disaggregate the run and the more complex it is to manage compared to the previous generation with the traditional run. So how will AI impact, um, well, we are not yet talking about the optimization because that would be maybe a topic for 6G or something like that. But then how are you seeing the impact of AI evolution in open run? So maybe I start <laughs> because <laughs> I brought open run or all run into the picture. So my example was, so the X apps are or the, the run intelligent controller with the X apps, that's one place where the algorithms, AI algorithms can be used or could be used. That's for sure. Now, what is also happening is that, um, and this is not even open, open run only topic, but I know that quite a few run vendors, well-known run vendors, they do have AI and ML functionality in the radio unit itself on top of the mast. You know, working on the beam forming and, and interference control and uh, and uh, kind of uh, using machine learning in that space by uh, uh, kind of um, understanding how the radio landscape looks like in this particular cell. So AI and ML is already used in radio units by by many vendors. And XAPS is just, just another very good place to uh, to have AI functionality in, 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 in the form of X apps. Anybody? Uh, maybe kind of, I uh, would like at uh, uh, overall, uh, let's say, I think the kind of uh, uh, AI is still a very immature technology. If you think of your, 
let's say like a so- software system, software solution, AI is the most immature part of it, most likely to fail. It's becoming more and more easy to kind of build, uh, let's say like AI uh, enabled uh, or let's say like uh, AI enabled solutions in the cloud. Uh, but kind of when you start going to the edge, when you start having the kind of a hardware related problems, when you start uh, having the, let's say the uh, la- latency, lack of compute that, that type of issues, it becomes multiple times more, more complex. So I would say, uh, I, I'm kind of saying that those are not the uh, things that we are going to solve within the next few years, but it's, uh, yeah, like, I think it, it's coming. I think we kind of need to kind of work there, uh, work towards that together, but uh, not seeing any quick wins. I think uh, that's about it uh, from today. Thank you for the great panelists and let's give a round of applause. Okay. Mm-hmm.